everyone, it's John from What Up, and welcome back to another video. And we're talking Easter eggs for the season two finale of Sony and Amazon's Wheel of Time show. So if you're new to the channel or you're just finding us, that's what we do here. We talk about the Wheel of Time. We'll do reviews, Easter egg videos, and breakdowns of every single episode. But we also cover the news, everything from the mundane to the fantastical, the rumors to the official, and leaks. Anything and everything you want to know about season three and beyond of the Wheel of Time, we're going to cover it here in the channel. In fact, I have a couple of season three leaks coming for you next week. And we're also covering all of the official news because they are still filming season three. We got a, a couple more weeks of filming yet to go before they finish that. So there is a ton of news to talk about. Now, all of that being said, today we're talking about Easter eggs from the finale. Now, the finale was generally well received by most of the fandom. And I will say this, it had a absolute ton of fan service and a lot of little easter eggs that pointed to moments both in the book series and things we may see in the show much later on i've tried my very best to gather most of them in this video although i likely am going to miss a couple of them here and there so if you happen to notice something that i haven't picked up please leave a comment down below and let me know what i missed and where this easter egg is and uh, kind of explain it a bit for us and i'll do another video in a couple of weeks basically amassing all of the easter eggs from the entire season that i missed because there are a few so far now all of that being said, before we get into the video, I have to give a spoiler warning, and it's a full book spoiler warning, so if I ruin something unintentionally by talking about things throughout this entire video, well, I've given you a warning because that's what the spoiler warning is for, so spoiler warning, if you've not seen the first full two seasons of Sony and Amazon's Wheel of Time show streaming right now in Prime Video, and have not read the entire book series, The Wheel of Time by Robert Jordan and Brandis Henderson, that's a everything from A Memory of Light, the final book, all the way back to and including the first book, The Eye of the World, be forewarned, I may ruin plot points and character arcs from both of those mediums. All right, that being said, let's get on to the ton of Easter eggs that are in this episode. All right, folks, so at this point, I think it's no secret that this episode wasn't exactly my cup of tea. It wasn't bad, but it certainly wasn't my favorite episode at all. And that's totally okay. I talked about those reasons in my review, but one of the things I want to say about this episode, what they did extremely right, is the fan service the foreshadowing, and the Easter eggs. There are a ton of them. I felt like I was watching an anime from the early 90s. Well, maybe not. Maybe not that kind of fan service, but you folks get my drift. 100% they did a very good job with it. So, um, I want to start off by talking about visual mediums before we get into all of the Easter eggs that I found in this particular uh, episode, and that is that the Wheel of Time does one thing right um, more than anything else, and that's being able to visually tell a story to the viewers without having to use inner monologues or dialogues or people just grandstanding talking for a long time. So in this scene, you get a, a sequence between Dane and his father, Joffrey. Now, it hasn't really been talked about uh, what the ranks are, how they fit into the rank structure or um, how that works in the show. However, just by looking at them, you can tell that Joffrey is a higher rank than Dane because of his uniform. It's gold, which is better than silver. It's a little bit more ornate. They did a very good job showcasing that in the show. Um, so in the book series, Joffrey is one of the Council of the Anointed, which is, I think, a step below the Commander of the White Cloaks, so just one step down, a group of people that kind of head everything in the White Cloaks. And then Dane is just an officer. So this very visually represents that. I think it's a very cool way of starting off uh, this Easter egg episode by talking about how visually they did a very good job with a lot of different things, which leads us into this next Easter egg. So... The symbol of the Aes Sedai is uh, two parts, a, a white part and a, a black part. The white part is known as the Flame of Tarvalon, the black part is known as the Dragon's Fang. The Dragon's Fang represents male channelers, the white part of the Flame of Tarvalon represents female channelers. Now, Shaw May and Lanfear in this particular uh, scene are talking about balance. So they balance one another, and that's a theme of the Wheel of Time. Everything from the Eye of the World to a Memory of Light is about balance. So the male half balances the female half. Good balance is evil. It's all in there. When they're talking about balance, it shifts to this perspective. We know for sure we're getting two other Forsaken in the show. One of them we actually get to see at the end of this episode, Mogadian. She's she's there. So that's really cool. We'll talk about Easter eggs with her in a bit because there are a couple. The other one was name dropped was Grendel. So we know we're going to get Grendel at some point or another. We just don't know how or when. These other seals, though, who could they be? We see two very white seals in this particular uh, scene. So the white seals, I believe probably represent the two female forsaken the other seals we see three dark ones and one in the background that kind of looks sort of light sort of dark we're not really sure what it could be um at least there wasn't really a perspective where it looked incredibly light or incredibly dark like the rest of them here but if they're talking balance my guess is that's also likely a light colored seal for one of the female forsaken and the dark ones are likely for the male forsaken because of the dragon's fang and the flame of tarvalon so 
I think what they're going to do is they're going to have a male and female forsaken in pairings, kind of like a Shamael and uh, in Lanfear here. Maybe not in such a way that they're best friends or they're cozy like this, but likely just to carry on that theme of balance as we go forward in the series. Now, again, it could be four dark colored seals here and two light, but I think it's three and three. It's just really hard to tell. But either way, really nice little touch when they showcase this afterwards. All right, so this, the creepy white cloak kids. Um, not something I really ever thought about when I was reading the book series, if they would have these kids with them or not, but it's obviously a thing. It 100% is. A lot of medieval armies had children going with them at all times for different reasons. Um, and they had these kind of like smoke bomb things as they were like obscuring the battlefield as the White Cloaks came in. I think this was a direct kind of point out to the fog that arose in Falm during the Battle of Falm after the horn was blown because the heroes of the horn came out of the fog and they fought in fog back and forth. Ran and Ashamiel also fought in fog in the sky. So we didn't get that part of it. I think this was just a nice little call out to that. As uh, as the White Cloaks came into battle, they came in shrouded in fog. Kind of neat either way. And we have this. We have Nynaeve taking on the mantle of the Suldom. So they call her to Suldom and they took her uniform. It didn't pay off exactly the same ways in the books. In fact, I would say that this particular... Um, bit of storyline didn't pay off at all because it didn't really give us uh, an idea of what's going to happen much later set up storylines that would happen later i think there might be cut but i think it was a little call out to the fact that during the book series Nynaeve and elaine did this and then that's how they rescued Egwene. so Egwene didn't rescue herself in the book series she was actually helped out by her friends um so i think this is a nice little nod to that actually little part of the story in the great hunt now this, this here is another kind of a big Easter egg. Um, we're getting end book Ishamael much earlier in the series, which I think is a great thing because Ishamael, uh, until the end of book three, was really 2D. He just was kind of an insane dude who thought he was the dark one, and that's basically his whole shtick. That's what he did. Now, in the book series, much later on, he becomes Morden after he's reborn, and he's a little more lucid, a little more sane. He talks about wanting to end the wheel, make the, the, the cyclical nature of his battle with the light stop because he's just so tired. We're getting a lot of that from Ishamiel much early on um, in the series, so I think they're going to really lean into that and when he dies at the end of this episode, much like he does in the books, um, there's a question of whether or not he's going to be reborn as Morden because Morden's really needed for what things happen later on. But if Ishamiel's already laid all of this out, are we going to get it? I really don't know. Either way, I liked the callouts to his later character of Morden in the book series when he's talking about uh, basically um, in this life or another, he doesn't have much time left. Now this... Loyal here is basically giving a little bit of an inspiring speech to everybody as they're uh, in the middle of the battle, and it's a call out to the fact that he is actually writing a book in the series. So he is the narrator of the story, um, not the Wheel of Time, but his own story. So he writes a book about everything, and that's a big part of his character in the book series. He's always taking notes. He's always writing things out. And he's always putting himself as uh, not a hero, but everyone else around him as being heroes. So when he's saying that they're the heroes of another age, it's because... He wrote the book that way in the series, and uh, I would imagine people will still be reading as legends in ages to come because it is such an epic story. All right, so in this next Blink If You Miss It moment, which is actually paid off much later on in the episode, um, you get to see it more clearly, is a sitter for the Blue Aja that was captured right next to Egwene in the tower. She's taking part in the battle, um, and you get to see her actually weaving fire and taking part in the battle. So my question here is, is it the fact that she is just using the power willy-nilly, or is she perhaps seeing the people she's fighting as dark friends? Because not everyone believes the White Cloaks are fully dark friends. They just kind of think they're shitty people that have shitty ideals and have a very skewed view of the world. But perhaps she thinks they're dark friends so she can use the one power on them. Kind of a question I want to answer in another video later on, but something I wanted to bring up in the Easter egg video to get you folks thinking about it. Let me know in the comments down below uh, how and why you think she can use the one power here as a weapon, or is she just flubbing it, chucking things at buildings, which is totally accepted under the three oaths. All right, we have to talk about this scene. Um, this whole scene, instead of seeing it on screen, was sort of a call out as an Easter egg. So Turok pulls his blade. He said, let's see what it takes to earn, an hair, earn a heron on this side of the ocean. And for show watchers who haven't read the books, it seemed like a really cool scene. However, 
For book readers, we all knew it was at this point that Rand pulled his sword and actually became a blade master for the first time. However, in the book series, he had a lot of training from Lan, he had a lot of use of the sword off screen, he had the flame in the void, which really hasn't been mentioned a whole lot on the show at all. Um, he really came into his own, and this is when Rand really became a blade master for the first time. Now, in the show, he hasn't had much training other than from Errol off screen earlier in this season. Um, he hasn't really resorted to the sword a whole lot. We know he knows some forms because of his interactions with Lan. Um, so there was always a question whether or not he was going to do this battle. So instead of actually doing it, what they did is they pulled an Indiana Jones style um, uh, surprise on us. And Turok said the lines exactly as they're said in the book in the same way as they're said in the book. He pulls the blade, he's ready for a fight, and Rand just decimates him with the power. It's one of the things that Rand was kind of made fun of by the Forsaken and other people in the book, like... Um, Master of Tame later on is that he always went for a sword first and never the power. I think we're going to see a little bit of a different Rand. We're going to see like more of an end game Rand much earlier because he's not relying on a sword at all. He's just using the one power. So either way, nice little call out to that scene in the book. Um, and I I totally believe this was a call out to Indiana Jones. It it had to have been because it was almost the exact same sequence. Pull the sword, flourish, get shot. All right. Next up is this. This is another scene from the book that ended up as an Easter egg rather than an actual film scene, uh, but it was kind of a nice little call out to it. So in the book series, Ingtar was a dark friend. He is the one that let everyone into the keep. He is the one that allowed the horn to be stolen, and he had a lot of guilt about a lot of different things. He tried so hard throughout that entire book series, like throughout that book rather, The Great Hunt, to get the horn back because he was thinking of his own personal salvation and not anyone else's. This scene in the books where he held 50 men or more by himself um, was his version of redemption now they call out to that scene in this particular um you know sequence here where he says this passage looks like one man could hold 50 or more that's what he's talking about there was a prophecy in the book series called five ride forth for return and it's about incar's death um, didn't make it into the final cut of the show obviously um, although it was nice that they had a little call out to that and that he did die even though a lot of show watchers probably would not have even guessed at any point or another that he was a dark friend, that he had anything to do with the theft of the horn. Um, but for book readers, we did get to see that, and we probably know that this, that stuff maybe happened off screen, um, not really shown to the show watchers, and we get some sort of conclusion to Inktar's storyline, which I thought was kind of neat. All right, next up is something that may have been a little confusing to show watchers, um, and that was the inclusion of Bail Damon for about three seconds in this particular episode. Not really, a little bit longer than that, but he was supposed to pick up the seals and dump them in the ocean. This was a call out to two separate different instances in the books. The first one was Bail Damon was actually there at the Battle of Falm. He had made a deal with Nynaeve and Elaine to take them to safety afterwards, um, and he had to leave without them was a big source of guilt for him in the books and that he left them behind um but he had to flee before the Shan Chen ships basically took over the harbor and burned his ship so he was included in the series uh in the in the great hunt as part of the battle but not really it was a very brief inclusion sort of a call out to a character we met in book one um and that's the first part of this easter egg is that he's there he's doing stuff and um he's instead going to be doing something for the lady Celine. now what he is asked to do in the book series much later on is to drop a male Adam into the ocean, the deepest part of the ocean where no one will ever find it, get rid of it, it's going to be gone forever. He doesn't do a very good job at that, and it ends up being a storyline where Rand actually gets captured. So when Lanfear is talking about the seals, she's talking about something just as dangerous as the male Adam was to Rand, and that's the seals of the Forsaken. Dump them into the ocean, no one will ever find them, um, get that done. And Beldamont, again, doesn't finish his task because Lanfear never actually gathers the seals as we see at the end of the episode. So I think it's a nice little Easter egg call to both of those storylines, including him. Um, and hopefully we'll see a little bit more of him in season three and beyond because I really like his character. Although I have an idea that likely his storylines may be cut. We may not see um, some of the characters he interacts with because he is heavily influenced by the Sean Chan storylines in the series. Next up, we have this scene here. This is a Shamiel showing up to High Lady Suroth. He said he had to attend to other things, and he's dusting his hands. Well, this is foreshadowing to the very end of the episode where you come across all of the seals are broken. I think at this point, that's what he was doing. He left everyone to their own devices, went and broke all the seals, released all the Forsaken, sent them on their way, um, and uh, that's what he's talking about here, saying he had another thing to do. All right, now we're going to talk just about Matt 
the dagger, uh, the horn. There's a couple of different things here. But essentially, in the book series, Matt has a weapon. He gets it from the Aelfin and the Aethin. They are sort of, uh, they're called the snakes and the foxes. Think of them as an alternate dimension filled with weird alien type creatures. Uh, one can answer questions and one can grant wishes. Um, Matt interacts with both of them at some point or another in the series and he gets some things. So one of the things he gets is an Ashen Diary, which is uh, a sword on a spear or sword on a quarterstaff, I guess is the best way to put it. It's an iconic weapon and it means a lot to Matt Cawthon. And here we're talking about the dagger. He can't touch the dagger. He can't go near the dagger. So instead he wraps it all up and he makes his own homemade version of an Ashen Diary. Now, one of the neat things about this is his Ashendari in the book series is carved with ravens on it. And we're going to see later on in another Easter egg that this particular piece of, I want to say furniture, since he rips it off the bed, is also carved with ravens. But we'll get to that in a bit. The next little Easter egg is this. So he uses the makeshift weapon he creates out of the dagger of Shader Logoth and a bedpost to cut through the door like it was a lightsaber, like it was butter. I'm pretty sure this is a call out to him in the Tower of Genji. Now, essentially, at one point or another, he uses it to draw a door and get his way out. Um, I think this might be a slight call out to that, using the Ashendari in this way. Either way, I thought it was a nice little uh, call out and Easter egg to the weapon and Matt Cawthon's character that we get in the book series. Now, remember when I talked about paying things off later on? Uh, the Sitter for the Blue Aja, she's here and she is not doing well. She didn't make it through the battle. But what's interesting about this scene is that after she dies, her ADAM falls off. And that calls back to Nynaeve and Elaine's storyline. So there's a whole storyline in the book series where Elaine and Nynaeve basically capture a Suldom. They go, they rescue Elaine, or Egwene rather. They capture her, her Suldom as well, and they leave them there. And they're found with the collars around their neck. And it ends up being a subplot to the Shan Chan storyline where they're trying to keep that quiet. This time, I don't think we're going to get that in the show because essentially when the Demone die, the necklace falls off. So there's no way of knowing that Suldan was collared unless they kind of retcon some things in season three or perhaps say someone saw her with a collar. I don't know if they're going to bother doing that, but that's what this little scene I think is meant to portray is that when they die, the collar comes off. So that Suldan that was with Nynaeve and Elaine isn't going to be found with the collar on after they're dead. All right, there's another neat little Easter egg. Matt Cawthon uses that lightsaber of uh, a weapon again to cut open the box that holds the Horn of Valir. Now, the old tongue writing around the outside of this horn, and it's been mentioned in a bunch of times before, we've seen it in promotional material, a lot of the fandom have already translated it. It is the Grave of Snow Bard of My Call, which is the call out to the Horn of Valir. It was also the call out and tagline for season two of The Wheel of Time. It's a very neat little Easter egg, just a brief shot of it here. The props department does go all out in little details, uh, so that little detail of that writing around the brim of the horn was fantastic. All right, next up we have Nynaeve and Elaine. Um, their storyline here was not what I expected from the finale, but this here, this instance, is just kind of hammering home of Nynaeve's block. Now, in the book series, she would have gotten incredibly angry and cursed and yelled at Elaine and gotten access to the One Power and was, would have been able to heal something like this. But in this scene, she was completely ineffectual in a number of different ways. And I think it's a call out to her and how she's feeling and maybe perhaps foreshadowing to her growth later on in season three. Because here, she's a wisdom. She doesn't do anything right as a wisdom. She tries to push the crossbow bolt through the leg with a fletching still on. Um, and actually, there were a few people on X that called that out that are actual historians. Um, she isn't able to use the one power to heal Elaine. She can't do anything. She can't do anything right. Her whole storyline of this particular episode is her failing again and again and again. She calls the Suldom. The Suldom dies. Um, she tries to heal Elaine. She can't do it. She's trying to use her training as a wisdom. It's not done properly. I think this all leads up to a big crisis of confidence for season three, um, which happens to Nynaeve in the books. It really does, but it happens a little bit later. So I think they're just accelerating that storyline. This is just a little call out to what we're going to see from her in the future. Now, this year, um, again, this Easter egg is a final big payoff to the fandom who has been complaining for two seasons now that Perrin doesn't have his axe. He picked up the axe exactly as most people have pictured it, exactly how it had been drawn in a lot of fan art, and 
He used it to kill Geoff from Bornhold. Now, this sets up the entire Two Rivers plotline of Season 3 in a much better way than it did in the book series, in my opinion. Uh, Dane has an actual real reason to go after Perrin other than rumors, but we'll talk about that more in my breakdown video. But this here, him having the axe, I think he's finally chosen the axe at this point, and he's going to use it for the next couple of seasons. All right. Remember I talked about this earlier with the ravens carved on that piece of furniture? Well, you can see it kind of clearly here in the lower right-hand side of the screen. Matt Cawthon's homemade Ashendari has the ravens carved on it in the show, just like it does in the book series. So I have no idea if he's actually going to get an actual weapon at one point or another. But I believe the elfin and the aphin are likely cut from the story. And we're going to talk about that in this very next Easter egg. And that is this. Matt Cotham blows the horn and he says he remembers. He remembers all his past lives. He remembers that he's a hero of the horn. Um, it's a bit much to take in because it's quite a bit different from the storyline of the books. But that's what they're going for here is that he is remembering everything. So I think this weapon may be the final weapon that he uses. I think this just might be it. It'll have its magical properties from the dagger shader to Logoth rather than being a power up blade from the elfin and the elfin. I think that's what we're going to see here. But... What's really interesting about this is after he blows the horn and the heroes of the horn start showing up, we get a good look at a number of different people here, uh, including some very familiar faces. So just to the left of Matt Cawthon here, we see Arthur Hawkwing. He talks with Matt Cawthon a bit, confirms that he's a hero from the horn. There's been a whole lot of questions about who the lady is in the red with the sword. Well, that is Emiratsu. She is the female equivalent to the Champion of the Light. Uh, she was only mentioned in a couple appendices here and there. Um, in some notes by Robert Jordan, she never actually made it into the book series, but that's who she is. Uh, and then, of course, we get to see uh, a blonde archer, which could or could not be Brigida. We really don't know. Um, it's possible, although I'd like to think that they're probably going to, to cast her much later on with uh, a permanent role, because I don't think this is a credited role, like a, like a named role for anybody, uh, and a number of other heroes here. Now, we're going to talk about the elephant in the room. It's time to toss the dice. So this line here is a huge staple of Matt's character in the book series. He learns it from his past lives and he uses it a lot. He says it in the old tongue a lot before he gains any of his past memories. Um, and it was a massive moment of fan service. One of the few times in this episode I jumped up and cheered because I loved seeing Matt say this. And uh, I think a lot of the fandom will agree with me that they were very happy to see this. So kind of a big moment of fan service, so to speak. And a bit of an Easter egg too, because we now know that Matt Cawthon has access to all his past lives, or at least he did in this moment with the horn. Will it be jumbled in his brain afterwards, or will he become a master tactician and have all of his luck like he does in the book series? I don't know, because we're not sure if we're getting his full storyline. I think they're cutting the elfin and the aphin because he has a makeshift weapon. He has his memories. He knows he is a hero of the horn. Um, I think other than getting his fox necklace there's not much else that they're going to give him um maybe he'll go and get some answers from one of them but i don't think he's going to get the gifts if that makes any sense either way i can't wait to find out what they're going to do in season three and season four with this character because you set things up a little bit differently with him so far but i think the end result will be the same and we have this this like i said is the elephant in the room when it comes to heroes of the horn uno was a fan favorite both from book readers and show watchers so book readers loved uno he made it through right up into the blast battle and he was amazing he was great comic relief he was gruff uh, i don't think he was meant to be comic relief but i took him that way and i read the series he was always very gruff he cursed a lot he apologized for cursing a ton and guy roberts brought that character to life and people who hadn't read the book series he was a fan favorite for them, and it was quite a bit of a shock for him to die early on in this season, um, and a lot of people were very upset, myself included. I was very distraught we wouldn't get to see more Uno on screen. That's all changed. He is a hero of the horn, and I think there is a lot of evidence as to which hero he is, because he resembles Gadel Kane, which is Brigida's significant other. Now, Gadel Kane fights with two swords, and which is exactly what Uno is doing here. He gave his shield to Perrin, picked up another sword, and went to town. Um, he's not exactly a traditionally handsome man. Brigida is known to like ugly men, I think, as it says in the book series. Um, and I think that's what they're going for here with Uno, um, because Uno isn't traditionally handsome in the show either. They use a lot of makeup and different aspects to make him look hard and gruff and mean, and that's what Brigida likes. So, Gadel Kane, not right out and said it, but I think this is a huge Easter egg to the book fans. We know who he is, and I'm happy, and I can't wait to see him more often, especially in the World of Dreams later on in the book series. Or, sorry, in the show, rather. All right, 
So this here, uh, I want to talk just a bit about this. This was a call out uh, specifically for book readers. So there are some questions from people who haven't read the books about the final scene between Egwene and Shamil, how Egwene is holding her own. Now, some people are okay with it. Some people are saying that Egwene has a lot of training. In fact, she's the most trained out of anybody there. She's also the most powerful out of anybody there and has the most uh, abilities. So naive, ineffectual, she can't channel a lick. Elaine is hurt, Rand is shielded, um, and even if he isn't shielded, he doesn't know what he's doing just yet, so it made a lot of sense for Nine, or for Egwene to lead the battle here. But she's also fighting a Shamiel, the most dangerous Forsaken ever, and he's not winning. 100% he's toying with her because he wants to die. The whole point of this is him to die. Um, in the book series, it was exactly the same thing. So when he fought Rand in the sky above Falm, he could have killed him at any moment with the power. He could have done any number of really crazy things to end the fight, but he didn't. He wanted Rand to win. He wanted Rand to proclaim himself, and he didn't mind dying in order to do it. So this scene here was the same thing. He was doing absolutely the bare minimum possible to keep people engaged so he could die and Rand could proclaim himself. Because... You gotta remember, the end game of the dark is not to kill Rand, it's to turn him to the shadow. And if Shalmel can do that, then he will eventually realize his dream of breaking the wheel. If he just kills Rand, then he's gotta do everything all over again. So that's that's the call out here, the little bit of an Easter egg to the entire plot lines of that behind the scenes in the book series. Now this here, this is a great Easter egg as far as I'm concerned. So Elaine, the daughter heir of Andor, meets Rand for the first time. Now when Elaine introduces herself to pretty much everyone in the show, she's the daughter heir of Andor. Everyone calls her that. In the book series, Rand meets Elaine for the first time in the very first book. He falls into her garden in the palace of, in um, Camelin, and she treats his wounds and kind of like makes him feel better, banishes his hands, and that's what starts their spark, so to speak. This is a call out to that because she is above him. She does not introduce herself as the daughter of Randor. She introduces herself as Elaine, which is unusual for her, so she's obviously quite taken with him. And she does her best to heal the wound in his side, much like she healed him in the Eye of the World. So big call out to the meeting, a big call out to how their little spark is formed in the book series. That brings us to this. Although not gotten in the exact same way, Rand does receive a wound that doesn't heal in the Battle of the Shamil at the end of the Great Hunt. It's from his staff while they're fighting, um, and it's healed but it doesn't actually ever heal and it breaks open constantly and is a constant source of trouble and pain for him throughout the series but at some point or another he's also stabbed with a dagger and the two evils fight one another so i don't know if we're going to get that part of the storyline but for sure here we have a wound that doesn't look like it's healing even with the one power so it is a direct call to that same wound that he received at the end of the great hunt when he battled ashami on the skies above fall now here this I thought was awkward and, and weird way of Rand holding the sword when he first started it, but it's because it brands him that way. So at the end of the Great Hunt, Rand stabs a Shamiel. His sword is a power rock blade that shouldn't be hurt by the one power in any way, shape, or form, or any other thing. It's basically indestructible. It gets melted and twisted when he stabs a Shamiel. And that is his second time where he says, oh, I've killed the Dark One. <laughs> and he doesn't because he fights him again at the end of Book 3. Um, however... We get something a little bit different here. During that battle, he gets his hand branded because the whole blade heats up, and there is a heron on the hilt that burns into his hand. So far on the show, there haven't been herons on the hilt, and there was a lot of theory that it would be underneath the leather wrappings, and that's probably where we would see them, and he'd get his hand burned that way. However, that wasn't the case because he awkwardly held the blade while he jammed his sword into a shamiel, which caused the heron and the blade to heat up and brand his hand. So we're still getting the heron brandings. It's just... We're getting them in a different way. Now, again, this may also be a call out to his absolute ineptitude with the blade. Maybe he learned a few things from Errol. Maybe he learned enough to make it look like the sword holds him, or he holds the sword with an air of confidence, but I don't think he has any skills with the sword at all at this point, if the way he's holding this blade makes any sense at all, because he's actually gripping the blade when he's stabbing a Shamiel. I think that's what they were going for here. All right, next up is this. So, um, Rand proclaims himself with the Dragon Banner, um, the Sky fight with the Shamiel, which was cheesy as old get out in the books. I will 100% admit that. I was hoping they wouldn't do it, and they didn't, so I'm happy they didn't include it. Um, some people missed it. 
not something I missed at all. But instead, what they did here is they had a power rot dragon made out of fire kind of curl around Rand when he's on the top of the tower over, over Falm, and this is his way of being proclaimed in the show. So, yes, he's proclaimed in the sky of Falm with fire, uh, although in a much different way than the book series. All right. Last thing I'll talk about is Magedian the Spider. So in the book, she's called the Spider because she works from the shadows. She eventually, essentially pulls all the strings and doesn't like direct combat. She doesn't like going toe-to-toe -to -toe with people. Um, and she weaves a web of the one power around Lanfear here that is incredibly dangerous. At one point or another, during the scene, Lanfear cuts her hand on it as it contracts around her. So this is a huge Easter egg to call out that she is the spider in the book series. And I really enjoyed this. And I think that the actress who plays Mokedian is going to just absolutely nail it if this scene is any indication of that at all. All right, folks, so that's the Easter eggs I found during the episode. Like I said earlier, I'm sure there are more. And if you happen to find any, let me know in the comments down below. Uh, I'm going to be doing a breakdown of this particular episode soon. I have to do the breakdown for episode seven first, but they're both coming in the next couple of days. Don't worry about that. We have a long time where we can add to our repertoire of videos before season three drops. So um, I'll probably space them out by a couple of days here and there. There's also some brand new news coming out about season three today um, and some new news that is coming out, I believe, near the end of the week. We'll have videos on that. Uh, next week and I'll have my own leaks coming out about season three starting next week uh, because I have a fair number of them stockpiled for you folks we're going to hold the longing at bay we're 100% going to hold the longing at bay together because it may be a while before season three drops we can't even speculate on when, when that may be although my money is on likely either next fall or the fall after if they're doing the year-to-year -year thing with Lord of the Rings Rings of Power maybe next fall we'll get Rings of Power the following year we'll get the Wheel of Time so you got to remember they were done filming season two a long time ago. It just took that long in post-production to get the uh, special effects right, which I'm kind of happy with because one of the very few problems I, or one of the big problems I had with season one was a lot of the bad VFX. Season two was much better. So I'm hoping we kind of do the same thing. Either way, thank you so very much for sticking with us here to the very end. Here's to many more.